be ready to pick your jaw back up as we welcome 17-year-old Brittany to the TEDx Atlanta stage. All right, so, okay, that's loud. I want you all to picture a little kid in the Y phase. You know that kid that's always asking questions. Why is the sky blue? Why is the grass green? And about a million other questions per day. Now imagine, hypothetically speaking, of course, what it would be like 15 years down the line if that kid was still in the Y phase. As you may have imagined, this isn't quite a hypothetical situation. I'm a 17-year-old who loves to ask questions. But it wasn't until I found science that I found my answers and more questions, because with science, the more you know, the more you wonder. It's an infinite process, one in which I'm completely enamored by. So I love science because it gives us that opportunity to revolutionize the world around us. I think I first started seeing how many implications science really has when I was little. My brother was born premature, and he spent over 60 days in the hospital his first year. And many times after that, we would go back and visit. I really grew to idolize the men and women in scrubs because I could see that they were saving lives and using science to have a positive impact on the world. Then, as a seventh grader, my passion for science grew even further. I was taking an elective on futuristic thinking, and quite by accident, I stumbled across artificial intelligence. And I was enthralled. For computers can do things that humans can't, and that just is mind-boggling. I went home, I bought a coding book, and I decided that that's what I was going to focus on. Now, this was pretty naive. I never actually coded anything. So I started with all the stereotypical beginner programmers, programs, Hello World, card games, etc. And eventually, I did program artificial intelligence. And it played soccer, because at the time, and still today, I was a very avid soccer player. Now, my passions have surpassed my grade school aspirations. I'm combining medical research and computer science to improve breast cancer diagnostics. And I did this so that my computer program could answer one simple question. Is a breast mass malignant or benign? And this is really important, because fine needle aspirates, the least invasive form of biopsy, are actually the least conclusive. And this is a big problem, because a lot of doctors can't use them. If they can be used, it would lead to earlier detection, less invasion, and less cost. So I tried to create a tool for doctors to use so that they could diagnose these fine needle aspirates. And I did this by creating an artificial neural network, which is a type of program that can actually detect patterns that humans can't detect. I then put my artificial neural network that was diagnosing fine needle aspirates in the cloud, because the cloud is this amazing elastic entity that can scale to support usage by every hospital in the world. The current network is working really well. It is 99.1% sensitive to malignancy. And this is huge, because this is a number that could save a lot of lives and could make the program hospital ready. In addition, I've run 7.6 million tests. And I've proven that as I get more data, the success rate should increase, while the inconclusivity rate should decrease. So why is this important? One in eight women are impacted with breast cancer. And these statistics are just startling. And unfortunately, they're on the rise. However, when you have a personal encounter with breast cancer, that's when the statistics become more of a reality. For me, that happened my sophomore year of high school. My cousin was diagnosed with breast cancer, and I saw the pain that it inflicted on her and the rest of the family. I was inspired to make a difference. And my way of making a difference was to try to improve breast cancer diagnostics. So I talked to you a little bit about the fine needle aspirate. You know they're the least invasive procedure. You know they're also the least conclusive. So specifically in the United States, they're very rarely used. Most doctors won't use them. What they, act what they actually do is they, ex they cause the patient about the level of discomfort of a blood test. A doctor sticks a fine needle into a palpable breast mass, and a few cells are extracted and then stained, and then doctors look at them under a microscope. And then traditionally, doctors would decide whether the breast mass is malignant or benign. Now, these are great tests because they're the most accessible to the general public, so they can lead to earlier detection. They're also about four times cheaper than the core biopsy, which is the current means of diagnosing aspirates. And in addition, 
they cause women less physical and emotional scars, which is huge when you have to go through something as big as breast cancer. So that was the biology side of the project. But what's great about science right now is a lot of the breakthroughs are coming through interdisciplinary research. So here's a little bit on the computer side of the project. So artificial neural networks are actually programs that can model the brain's neurons and interconnections to detect patterns that we can't. And this gives them infinite potential because they're not limited on what we know. And for something like cancer, they're especially applicable because cancer is constantly mutating and constantly transforming. Neural networks are constantly learning, so they can pick up on these changes, learn how to handle them, and then still diagnose the masses correctly, which gives them a lot of potential. And not only are neural networks being used in the medical realm, but they've got a lot of exciting applications. Currently, they're being used at CERN, where the Higgs boson discoveries continue. They're also being used in more commonplace things, such as your iTunes or your Netflix. All the suggestions are based on your prior experiences, and they have neural networks figuring out what they think you'll like. Future implications could lead to smarter rovers, and a video game that just got smarter as the player got smarter, so it lasted forever, or even advances in earthquake detection. The other part of the computer science behind this project is the cloud. And a lot of us have probably heard about the cloud. It's this huge technology buzz term right now. And what the cloud allows for is it allows for servers to host my project. So what I mean by that is right now, I'm the only one, and a few other hospitals are accessing my program. So we don't use that much server space. But tomorrow, if a million hospitals decide they're interested in using it at the same exact time, my program will expand to all these different servers, and I'll be able to accommodate that. So I build it as a cloud service. And what that means is essentially my program exists out in cyberspace, and it's just waiting for somebody to use it. So it's looking for these messages, and right now you can call my program via a web application. So you can go online to cloudforcancer.appspot.com. Doctors can use it. It's working great. However, in order for a tool to be reliable, and the whole purpose of this is to provide a tool for doctors, it needs to be accessible. So some doctors are still using old PC systems. Others have moved towards mobile tablets, and there are new technologies that will emerge in the future. I can code platforms for these specific technologies, and they'll be able to call my app, and it will run. And one of the working examples of this is I'm actually working with an institute in Italy, and they were able to create a program to reclassify the samples they already have based on my program's inputs, and then call my service and get a response. So you might be wondering at this point, how does a neural network actually work, and how does it apply to breast cancer? Well, the way my neural network works is it takes in different inputs, and they're cytological inputs from these fine needle aspirates. So doctors rate the inputs on a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being this input looks like a very benign attribute, 10 being this attribute would lead us to think this is cancer. So one of the examples of the inputs is clump thickness. Is the mass mono or multilayered? Because monolayered masses are a lot more indicative of a mass being benign, whereas multilayered masses are a lot more indicative of cancer. Another example is marginal adhesion. And this is going to quantify how closely the outside cells on the epithelial tend to stick together. If they stick together really tightly, then that's a lot more indicative of a benign mass. And then another example is bland chromatin, which quantifies the texture of the chromatin in the nucleus. And if it's fine, that's a lot more like a benign mass, whereas coarse is a lot more like a malignant tumor. So you might be wondering if doctors can look at attributes and they can decide which attributes would be indicative of a benign versus a malignant mass, why do they need a tool to diagnose this? And the answer is these fine needle aspirates aren't cut and dry. The picture behind my head is a benign mass. And you might have guessed that because the cells are about the same size and about the same shape. However, if you look at the cells, they have little dots in them. Those are nucleoli. And the nucleoli should be barely visible, and there should only be one per cell. These nucleoli are very prominent, and there's multiple ones per cell. That would be an indicator of cancer. This next slide is also benign. And the marginal adhesion for this slide is great, which would make you think maybe you don't need to worry about cancer. However, you can see parts of the mass are actually multilayered, 
which is more of a malignant attribute. And this final slide is, is cancer. And the cells are pretty spread out. They're also different shapes, different sizes. So that would all lead you to think that it was malignant. However, some of the cells are actually devoid of their cytoplasm. If you look closely, you can tell that. And that would be more of a benign attribute. So as you can see, fine needle aspirates are not easy to diagnose. There's a lot of room for gray error. And you might think that I just went through and picked out three of the samples that were the least conclusive. However, these are normal FNAs. They're not the inconclusive ones, and they're pretty indicative of the entire data set. So the way the neural network actually works is it feeds in those nine inputs that are quantified on a scale of 1 to 10, and then it converts them into the artificial input layer. And this is something that's really novel to my program. What it does is it transfers the number into the binary representation of that number. So it now has four input nodes. And what's really cool is since neurons in the brain are either firing or not, and binary numbers are either ones or zeros, the digital spike and the neural spike are a lot alike. And bear in mind, the whole purpose of this program is to replicate the brain. So this helps the network get success. The artificial input layer and the hidden layer then make 216 connections, or synapses. And what's really cool is the way we model the way the brain communicates is actually via math. So what happens is the artificial input layer is then multiplied by a corresponding weight matrix. And then the weighted inputs going to each of the hidden no nodes are summed up via, sigmoids, via summation function. And then finally, they're sent to the sigmoid activation function. The sigmoid function is a logistic S-shaped curve. And essentially, it's going to convert the number on a scale of 0 to 1, 1 being this node is definitely on, 10 being the, or 0 being this node is not on at all. A similar process then occurs between the hidden layer and the output layer. And the whole purpose of this slide is to show you that through math, we're able to replicate the way the brain thinks. And this is a backpropagation neural network, meaning it's going to learn based on its experiences and mistakes. So these connections are constantly updated once it learns what's beneficial. So this is the sigmoid curve that I was talking about. And something that's really unique to my program and really important and instrumental in its success is the fact that I weight malignancy heavily. It is really important to diagnose cancer patients correctly. So on a scale of 0 to 1, I'm only going to call a mass benign if the network thinks the value is under 0.2. Programming an artificial neural network is not an easy task, and it's one. <laughs> so I, I'm not afraid to admit, I actually failed twice before the successful network. Um, the first time, there were more errors than code, so I ended up scrapping the entire program. And the second time it compiled, I was really excited. I started running my, ta my tests. It's actually worse than flipping a coin at diagnosing breast cancer. <laughs> But the important thing about science is you learn just as much from your flopped experiments as you do from your successful ones. So I was able to take what I learned from my experiments and improve upon that in this third implementation. And that's why the neural network gets more success than previous university trials and more success than its commercial counterparts. I'm working with raw data. So the University of Wisconsin published this data, public domain on the UCI machine learning repository. And I'm using all 681 samples. I'm not stripping any outliers, and I'm not having doctors go through and weight input importance. I'm letting the neural network use its own brain to figure that out. I also have this artificial input layer, which I went into at length. Not only does this make the program more brain-like, but it also makes sure one node doesn't become way too important, while another node becomes completely minute. The heavy malignant weighting, again, is just to make sure the cancer di patients are diagnosed correctly because those are the diagnostics that are going to save lives. And then something that's really cool about my program is the inconclusive logic. Often in computer science, having no answer is equivalent to failure. But for medicine, that's certainly not the case. So I researched, and I tried to find a good way to implement the inconclusive logic. And what I found is that the few programs that are doing inconclusive analysis actually determine all of the, you'll see the sigmoid curve that's right next to the inconclusive logic. All of those values that are in the middle part would be deemed inconclusive. And you saw the fine needle aspirates. They're difficult to diagnose. So a lot of those values actually fall within that middle part. 
So if I had done my inconclusive logic that way, I wouldn't be a usable tool. So instead, I simultaneously create 10 different neural networks. Since all the neural networks learn a little bit differently, just like we all learn a little bit differently, for the truly inconclusive samples, they get different results. So they take a vote. And if they don't all agree, then that's how a mass is deemed inconclusive. So I talked a little bit about commercial products. And what I mean by that is there are these commercial software pack packages that allow you to create a neural network without having to code it. So it's kind of like Excel. You can go in, you can create a graph, and you can pick the colors and the scale, but you don't have to code it. You don't have to draw the graph. You can do that with neural networks as well. You can pick the learning rate. You can pick the training technique. But of course, you're limited a little bit on the customization factors. So I tested three of the leading commercial brands. And then I also created my own network in Java. And I found my own network to be about 5% more sensitive to malignancy than the best of those commercial products. So I'd like, you to I'd like to run through my application. And this is what you would find if you go on cloudforcancer.appspot.com. It's in the Google App Engine, and you're free to visit it if you would like. So the way it works is doctors get these drop-down menus. And they pick on a scale of 1 to 10. So let's say the doctor is going to pick the, the, the mass. So let's say they think it's a 4. This means that the attribute is not clearly benign. It's bordering the benign line, but not definitive. Doctors will then pick that and go through and do that for all of the corresponding inputs. And almost instantaneously, they receive a response. In fact, this demonstration is a little bit slower than what you would find online. The network is working really well. It's 99.1% sensitive to malignancy. And this is a number I keep coming back from, back to, because it's huge. This is a number that means it could save lives and a number that means it may be hospital ready with more data and more tests. I still retain a 96.63% specificity to benign masses. And this is also important because this means it's still diagnosing the majority of patients who don't have cancer correctly. So I'd like to take a minute to tell you about my future plans. Ever since winning the Google Science Fair, I've had this amazing platform that I can use to share my research with the rest of the world. So I'm actually getting this beta tested in hospitals. Lankanau like Medical Center up in Philadelphia is giving me more samples. Because as the neural network gets more samples, it gets smarter because it has more experiences to learn from. An institute in Italy is also testing my network against 400 dubious samples. And if it does well, this could prove to be a partnership where I get up to 15,000 more samples to add to my network. I'm also working on extending this program to other types of medical diagnostics. I recently acquired some new ovarian cancer data. So I'm trying to make the neural network extend to that because I finally got this platform that's working really well. And so I'm really excited about the future of my program, and I can't wait to see it in the hospitals. And so I'd like to end in typical science fashion with one question. Why should you care about this research? And since this is science, it's going to lead to another question. Who do you know that would be impacted with better breast cancer diagnostics? You might be excited about the future. I think we just all feel better about the future. <laughs> Thank you so Thank much. You.